Hey y'all, Dr. Carmen Corder with TheDoctorNurse.com and I had a request to get a resource out to y'all covering beta adrenergic drugs and so I thought maybe the quickest way was to just shoot a quick video for you guys because I'm sure that the person that asked for this is not the only one that struggles with this topic or struggles, struggles with farm in general. So we're just going to do a real quick video on beta adrenergic blockers and beta adrenergic agonists. Now when I talk about adrenergic, adrenergic just simply means um, it's referencing the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, So a beta adrenergic blocker is blocking stimulation from the sympathetic nervous system whereas a beta agonist I like to say is egging it on. Okay, so a beta agonist is intensifying the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So let's start over here with our beta adrenergic blockers. These are our drugs that end in LOL or drugs like metoprolol, carvedilol, propranolol, atenolol. All those LOL drugs are beta adrenergic blockers. And so their main job, um, I teach my students, it is not just about blood pressure, y'all. It is about so much more than that. These um, LOL drugs, these beta blockers, they act on beta receptors in the heart. And if they are non cardio selective, like propranolol, they also have an effect in the lungs. So your beta-1 receptors are mainly located in the heart and smooth muscle. And then you also have beta-2 receptors that are located in the lungs. And so when we talk about cardio-selective beta blockers versus non-cardio-selective beta blockers, that's what we're talking about. So our more cardio-selective beta blockers like metoprolol only target those beta adrenergic receptors in the heart, which is what we want them to do. On the other hand, non-cardio-selective beta blockers, which the first one that comes to mind is the older one, um, propranolol, it also is going to have an effect on the beta-2 receptors located in the lungs. And we do not want this to happen. Uh, because the main overall goal of beta blockers, well, there's several goals actually. We give beta blockers, yes, for hypertension, but we also give beta blockers in certain dysrhythmias, like if somebody's throwing a lot of PVCs. We also give beta blockers to our CHF patients because our beta blockers block conduction through the AV node or slow conduction through the AV node. So what that does is that slows our heart rate. And what that does for CHF patients is when you slow that heart rate down, it gives the ventricles more time in diastole. So it gives them more filling time. Okay, great thing for a CHF patient. Another thing that beta blockers do, they decrease the contractility of the heart they have a negative inotropic effect on the heart. And this just provides the heart with rest, it slows down the rate, it slows down how hard it's supposed to be working. This is also why we do not give beta blockers if your patient is in an acute exacerbation of CHF, meaning they're sitting on the side of the bed, they're huffing and puffing, their BNP is through the roof. You're not going to give a beta blocker in that instance because you don't want to decrease heart rate and you don't want to decrease contractility in someone who is having a problem pumping the blood forward to begin with and they are acutely exacerbating their CHF. They also vasodilate. So beta blockers work on the peripheral, the smooth muscles out in the periphery and they vasodilate. So this does a couple of things which it decreases preload which preload, another word for it is venous return. So what's coming back to the right side of the heart from the body is decreased, which that's a good thing for somebody in CHF because that decreases the volume that the heart has to deal with. Vasodilation also decreases afterload, 
which afterload is the force that that left ventricle has to overcome in order to pump out to the body. So a vasodilated vessel decreases that afterload. So all of these things work together to decrease the overall workload on the heart. You might hear your teacher say it decreases myocardial oxygen consumption. That's a good thing for the heart to require less oxygen because it's not working as hard. So this is why I say it's not all about hypertension. It is about decreasing preload, decreasing afterload, providing the heart with rest after an MI um, in our chronic CHF patients. Now, back to our non-cardioselective beta blockers like propranolol. Well, propranolol also targets those beta-2 receptors in the lungs, which can result in very dangerous bronchoconstriction in patients with pre-existing asthma or COPD. So that's a huge test tip right there, y'all. If you're in farm and you're being tested over these type of drugs, know that right there, that we've got to exercise extreme caution in respiratory patients when we're administering beta blockers, in particular, non-cardioselective beta blockers like propranolol. Now, with talking about the all the positive effects that our beta blockers have on the heart, um, we talked about the bronchoconstriction, but they also can increase potassium. So there is a risk for hyperkalemia when you give beta blockers because of the way that they act um, and the uh, some of the chemical reactions, the way that they act on the sodium potassium pump beta blockers can increase potassium. So you've got to watch for hyperkalemia when you are giving beta blockers. So on the flip side, you know, when I teach endocrine, I say, if you learn one disorder, then you've got the other disorder because they're just opposite. Well, it's true with our beta adrenergic blockers versus our beta adrenergic agonist. Remember I said that beta adrenergic agonists egg on the sympathetic nervous system. So they egg on that fight or flight um, system. And these typically end in ROL instead of LOL. So you have two main categories that I'm just gonna touch on. You have your short acting beta adrenergic agonist and your long acting beta adrenergic agonist. The main difference here is our, our, our uh, excuse me, our albuterol is a short acting, so that's gonna be like our rescue inhaler. When someone is having an asthma attack, an acute asthma attack, albuterol is our go-to drug. The things like formoterol, the long acting beta adrenergic agonist is not a rescue inhaler, okay? It is not going to act immediately on those bronchi to open them up and help the um, asthma patient breathe better. Okay, so those are the two major classes. So you've got short acting, long acting. And you'll see over here on this side of the board where we have bronchoconstriction in beta blockers, we have bronchodilation. Well, that's the main therapeutic outcome of our beta adrenergic, adrenergic agonist. Um, with they are mimicking the sympathetic nervous system, so they're getting the body ready to fight or flight. So they're opening up those bronchi, they're opening up the airways to uh, prepare the person to take in more air. So they are bronchodilators. They might also, you might also hear them referred to as short acting bronchodilators or long acting bronchodilators, same thing. Um, and also with mimicking the sympathetic nervous system, you're gonna have to watch for an increase in heart rate. And unfortunately that is just going to happen. When you give a patient albuterol, their heart rate's gonna go up. So you're gonna know to watch for tachycardia. Now, if the tachycardia gets way too extreme and they start dropping their cardiac output um, as evidenced by hypotension, dizziness, lightheadedness, things like that, then uh, you might need to look into something else. But just by and large, the patient is going to become tachycardic just simply because of the mechanism of action of these drugs. They mimic the sympathetic nervous system. Now on the flip side, we're over here, we're watching for hyperkalemia. Over here, we're watching for hypokalemia. So you absolutely have to monitor potassium levels in patients that are getting 
lots of albuterol or lots of beta adrenergic agonists because they can become hypokalemic. And I even, to reinforce and drive this point home, I even remember back in my day when I was a brand new baby nurse in CCU, I had a doctor tell me that when patients would come in and like they've missed a dialysis treatment or something and their potassium is through the roof, the um, prescriber would order albuterol treatments until that potassium was lowered and normalized because albuterol is that powerful of a drug to decrease potassium. So always remember to watch your potassium levels when you're giving beta adrenergic agonists um, like albuterol or formoterol, anything that ends in R-O-L. So that about wraps it up. That's about as quick as I can make it. Beta adrenergic blockers versus beta adrenergic agonists. I hope you got something out of this video. If you're watching it from YouTube, be sure to check out all the other stuff that I've got up on the website, thedoctornurse.com. And I just want to thank you so much for watching my video.